Welcome to the Cash Car Convert Podcast, episode number 45. You're listening to the Cash Car Convert Podcast with James Kinson. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Cash Car Convert Podcast. My name is James Kinson and I am the Cash Car Convert. And this is the podcast where cash cars are cool and auto debt is dangerous to your financial future. This week I'm really excited. I uh, had an opportunity to go to FinCon uh, September 18th through the 20th and participate in multiple uh, uh, components of that conference. Got to introduce a keynote. Uh, I was up for an award uh, for my podcast while I was there. I got to speak on a panel and I got to do a live podcast from there. So I was very pleased to have so many opportunities to participate and be a part of this conference. So it was a, it was an honor and I met a lot of really wonderful people while I'm there and I'm really um you know trying to make sure I reach out to everybody and stay in contact because uh lot, some really quality people were in attendance and I I definitely want to take those relationships forward. So for the interview I'm doing today, it was done in front of a live audience of people. Now this isn't an audience where people were sitting and listening specifically to what we were doing. This was an open common area where registration was going on and there were a number of side conversations going on as this was recorded. Uh, A lot of these people at FinCon only see each other uh, once a year at the conference. So there were a lot of people catching up. So there's a lot of background noise, as you might expect. Uh, We did have some some interaction with the uh, people that were in the audience. And uh, at the very beginning, I had some technical issues. So there's actually some of the uh, content was was not captured, and so uh, I do believe that what was captured is going to be valuable to you. Uh, we have a really wonderful story through the interview of all the things that uh, that uh, my interviewee has done and accomplished. And uh, this gentleman's really uh, done a lot in a very short period of time. He launched his podcast in April of 2013, and uh, that that podcast is called Starve the Doubts. Uh, since then, he's gone on to. Uh, be a co-founder of a conference known as the Podcast Movement. And that went from inception to conference in, I believe, roughly about seven months. So pretty, pretty radical timeline to to do a conference. And uh, the conference, you know, all the feedback I've had from people who went to the conference, including myself, uh, was that it was a fantastic conference. So, uh, so really well done on that. And as all, as though all those things weren't enough, he's also spoken at multiple conferences. Uh, He spoke at NMX, Earlier this year, he spoke at certainly the podcast movement, which was his own conference, and then he's speaking at FinCon, and I think he's spoken at some other events maybe that I'm not even aware of. So uh, really, um, you know, getting himself out there quite a bit. Then last but not least, he is an Amazon number one bestselling author. He wrote a book called Podcasting Good to Great, and it's all about how uh, you can drive growth of uh, your, your podcast by making connections to others. And, uh, you know, this is one of those areas where Jared is very giving and by giving, he gets people. Uh, he's just a, he's a wonderful connector. It's probably the best thing I can say. And I'm honored to, uh, to have him from, uh, as a friend. So Jared Easley is the gentleman I did the interview with. And, uh, I think you'll enjoy that content when we, uh, when we get to that. There's a couple of other people that are going to be referenced in the podcast episode. And I thought it might make sense to, uh, let you know who those folks are so that when you hear their names, you'll know uh, who they are. And, and we have some fun uh, uh, during the interview with, with uh, some of these guys. Uh, Steve Stewart is uh, from Money Plan SOS, and that's MoneyPlanSOS.com. And Steve is somebody that I met through my podcast, and he's been a real uh, advocate for my show and uh, just super, super nice to me, been very kind. And he was the same thing at uh, at FinCon. He introduced me around again. This podcast, I mean, the uh, the FinCon conference had about 600 people in attendance. So there were lots of people there I didn't know. And Steve helped me navigate those waters and got me introduced to a lot of people. So I had a really uh, great time and been very much in debt to him for that. You also may hear PT mentioned, and PT is Philip Taylor, and he's the gentleman who had the idea to create FinCon and to to bring all these financial uh, people together. Just a wonderful conference. It grows every year, and it was my pleasure to to be in attendance. This is my first year, but wow, had a really great time. And it was in New Orleans, so you you can't go wrong there. We had a wonderful time in New Orleans, just a a wonderful venue. So so that's all I'm going to say about that for now. I'm going to let the interview speak for itself when we get to it. Uh, again, I think there's a lot of good content there, and I hope you enjoy it. The thing I want to close with before we jump into the interview is um, I uh, mentioned last week that we were going to be doing the drawing 
for the Smart Money, Smart Kids book, the autographed Dave Ramsey, Rachel Cruz book. I did do that drawing, just to kind of have a background for those of you who might be interested. I uh, took all the reviews, printed them all off, cut them into strips, folded them up nice and small, put them in a, a vase, and then uh, you know mixed them all up really good, and then reached in and uh, pulled out a name. And the gentleman who won the autographed book is Frank Manzella, and his interview or his his, his review was listed as Tokyo Frank. And uh, Frank's uh, uh, somebody that uh, I met, I guess, back in maybe August, uh, maybe July. But um, he has his own podcast called Cash Flow Apprentice. I was a guest on his show a while back, and I really enjoyed the experience. But I have to admit, I thought of all the uh, listeners that I have and all the ratings and reviews that I have, mostly having come from the U.S., that uh, I would only have to worry mostly about shipping this thing from the U.S. But sure enough, uh, the gentleman who won it is in Tokyo. So I'll be shipping this book international to make sure that Frank gets his copy. If you'd like to congratulate Frank on uh, on having won the book, I would recommend reaching out to him on Twitter. And that's at Frank underscore Manzella, M-A-N-Z-E-L-L-A. And just a uh, really nice guy. Glad he was able to win this and I hope he gets some uh, good enjoyment out of it. All right, with that, I think I'm going to uh, get out of the way here and uh, get straight into the interview with Jared Easley. Hope you enjoy. That's right. I am giving away free shirts. Now, I'm going to have this young lady, Sophia, if you could sit down here for a minute while we're waiting. Sophia, tell us, let's, let's take a big swim in Lake U. All right. Her name is Sophia. Sophia, what, what does that shirt say? Star of the Doubts. Star of the Doubts. Okay. Okay, come on, come, come on, over. have come a seat. Come well, I don't know, I don't know if you, uh, let's see what sizes I have left here. Oh, yes, come on over. We have another winner. Winner, winner, chicken Okay, dinner. so we're giving away t-shirts, James. We're giving away t-shirts. I like it, I like it. But I'm, I'm running that. out of certain sizes, so. We need some bigger people. We, yeah, we need, we need, we need some <laughs> we larger need some people, people in our audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's all you, there you go. Joe Taxpayer, is that really your last Joe. name? It's good, thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Joe. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> appreciate your business. So uh, tell us about yourself real quick. My name's Sophia. I write at Caviar and Quarters. This wow. is my first podcast appearance. So As it should cool. be. Nice. No. Yeah. Um, I'm from Washington, D.C., newly. Yeah. Originally from Boston. And I've been to FinCon all four years. Okay, so one of the questions that James likes to ask everybody that's on his show. Go ahead, James. Yes. What was your first car? How did you get it, and how did it work out for you? My first car was a 2009 Scion XD. Um, I Seems practical. Took it, yeah. Um, it was about $15,000. I took out a car loan, which I'm still paying. <gasps> oh, this is, you do know the name of this podcast. I know, right? I know. <laughs> I, I can. Okay, fair enough. Um, but I only have $2,000 left on it. Okay, that's good. That's good. So, pay, it, pay it down, own it another five years. You're all good? Uh, I would say in another six months. Ah, it's good to have goals. <laughs> yes. And um, it is working out great so far. Okay. Good. But I probably won't buy another car unless For I have cash. Years. There you go. Unless she has cash. Yeah. Lesson learned. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. We appreciate that. Thank you. Appreciate your well business. Well done. Thank you. All right. Good job. Moving on. Yep. That, was fin- that was fun. It was fun. It was off, you know, off record. Off, well, not off record. Off, off script. Yeah, there off you go. Off script, yeah. Yeah, people can work here and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Come join us. Start talking. Well, it's when you give good, away man. free T-shirts, you know, it, 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 it's a yeah. compelling thing. We, we so. appreciate that. Yes. So, Jared, tell me a little bit about your story. Um, we, I know you started the podcast movement. You're an Amazon number one best-selling author now as well. Um, give me, give me a little bit about your journey. How did you go from starting a podcast to? To becoming uh, an entre- entrepreneur. Well, I started. I say that word. Well, I, last year I was trying to figure out what to do, and there's a lot of really good bloggers here at FinCon, and I didn't feel like writing was my strength, so I didn't want to pursue writing because, I've, truthfully, I had self doubt. I was thinking, no, I couldn't do that. That's something that I wouldn't be good at. Maybe I could try something different. And I was listening to a lot of podcasts. And for anybody who's in this audience right now, if you're not listening to podcasts, you want to consider doing that. It's a great way to reclaim your downtime. And you can get a lot smarter. And I know James has <laughs> got a great testimony to this. I mean, you, you've listened to podcasts, too. Absolutely. And it's free education. And yeah. you can find what shows that you're interested in, what topics. So I was listening to a lot of business podcasts, and I thought it'd be interesting to have conversations with some of these people that are doing these business, con, uh, business podcasts. And 
then I, I realized um, through listening to another show, I realized that I, even though I'm not a quote unquote expert, I can have conversations with experts. I can be the reporter. Yeah. And once I realized that, I was okay. Let's get a podcast together. But isn't it expensive to have a podcast, James? No, not really. Okay, well, I'm glad you said that because it's true. You, you can get a USB microphone for less than fifty dollars on Amazon. That's right. And that's what I did. I got a, a microphone, and, and it's a USB. It plugs right into my computer, and there's free software, and it's like, okay, now I can do this. Now it's the weird part is asking for an interview. Yes. Right? Yes, so it's, yes. it's uh, going up to someone that you think is, has some credibility, whether it's in person or, or shooting them an email and just simply saying, hey, I've got a podcast. May I have a conversation with you? And some people said no, James. And then there were some people that were gracious and said yes. Started having conversations, put out a podcast, and I realized after I put out my co- podcast that nobody was listening to it. <laughs> so, so how do you fix that? I was at, my mom and I were, were the only ones that really liked the show. And, but that was a good thing to go through because when I went through that season of, of having a podcast but no one listened to it, that felt like now. You know, we're sitting here and, and nobody's <laughs> listening. No, I'm just kidding. There, there's four or five people. There's six? Okay. We're going to double as we wedding six, singers six people, after yeah. this. So we have six people nine. listening. But yeah, that's what it felt like when I was first podcasting. And so I realized then I, I need to actually figure out how to grow an audience. Yep. And so I went on a, a mission to try to figure out what do people want, what resonates, what works, what doesn't work. And through that process, James, I learned that one of the things that is fundamental, no matter what you're doing, what, what kind of finance blog you have, what kind of podcast you're doing, what kind of business you're doing, is you need to make your idea or your business about your target person. And the more that you can include them, the more that they'll have interest. Yep. And that strategy, I implemented that, and slowly over time, the podcast started to grow. And by having conversations with, with experts, smart people, sharing that, not only was I growing my network, but I also got ideas. I heard about a gentleman named, we'll call him PT. We'll okay. protect his anonymity. That works. Yeah, PT. And I had PT on my podcast and I, you know, that was that was a very expensive thing, and I had to pay a lot of money to get him on my show. <laughs> no, he, I heard that about him. He, he was very generous. He actually didn't charge me that time. So he he came on the podcast, and we started talking about PT's journey, and he told me the story of how he started FinCon, and I thought, well, this is fantastic. Here's a guy that didn't have any experience with events, and all of a sudden he decided, hey, I want to get this financial blogger community together. And he went through a process. He said, okay, I don't know how to do events, but I can have conversations with people who have. Yeah. I can connect with people who are influential in this space, and we can put together something and, and kind of uh, celebrate uh, everybody in this community. And so he went through that process, and now several years in, we're here in New Orleans yep. for FinCon. And having that conversation with PT was really powerful because a few months later, I heard someone at another conference say, why isn't there a podcasting conference? Great question. Yeah, when I heard that question, James, I realized, hey, there could be a podcasting conference. PT has proven you can create a conference even though you don't have experience with it and, and create a successful event like FinCon. Yes. So we, uh, I say we because I wasn't about to try to do a conference by myself. That would be ridiculous. Good That'd call. be crazy. Not everybody can be PT and do it by themselves. <laughs> Actually, PT doesn't do it by himself. We've met several of, of his uh, team, his A-list. There you go. So that said, reaching out, um, Thought of a couple people, Gary Leland, I know you know Gary, yes. Gary's there in the Dallas area, and, and Gary's uh, a veteran podcaster, he's been doing it since, I'd say 2005 at least, right. and just got a ton of experience, he's done the local, what we call pod camps, and they're free regional events for podcasters, and he had two of them in Dallas, moderately successful, and I reached out to, to Gary, I said, Gary, what, what do you think about taking this pod camp that you've done in Dallas and growing that into a national podcasting event? And he thought, well, that would probably take several years. That was his answer. And, yeah, okay, well, then let's, let's talk, talk through that process. Well, he was on board. He's like, yeah, I'd like to eventually grow it to that. Yep. We talked with Dan Franks, who's a CPA. He'd fit right in here at FinCon. I'm That's not right. sure why I'm he's not, sure not why. here. But yeah, me either. <laughs> Dan's a former professional wrestler, too, which I find is interesting. But he's yeah. 28 years old. He's relentless. He's great at marketing, great at WordPress. And so Gary and Dan and myself, and then later Mitch Todd jumped in, and we had a conversation with PT. This was just after New Media Expo this past January okay. in Las Vegas. Uh, we had a call with PT. We said, PT, if you were to start FinCon all over, what would you do different? Like, what would you do knowing what you know now if you were to start from scratch? And PT's like, okay, well, I would think of this. I would consider this. I would stay away from this. I would really focus on ABC. 
And at the end of that call, we, we knew, okay, we know enough information that we could potentially go and pursue this, but we need to validate the idea, James, because it doesn't make sense to just say, hey, here, I've got this great business idea. Let me throw thousands of dollars into something we weren't sure that was going to work. So how are you going to do that? So, yeah, and, well, I will, I'll tell you real quick. I, I ran into a gentleman downstairs, and this was a couple hours ago, but his name is Noah Kagan, and he does AppSumo. He's actually here at FinCon. Okay. And I took one of his courses uh, back at the end of last year, and I remember the biggest takeaway I had from that course that he taught was uh, validating your idea for your business before you launch it. And I knew, so if we're going to try to do an event that's never occurred before, we need to validate it. We need to make sure that it's, people want it. And at the time, we thought, let's try Kickstarter. Kickstarter's for crowdfunding. Yeah. And we looked around, and we realized there wasn't a history of successfully funded events on Kickstarter. Okay. And that was a little bit scary because thinking, okay, all these other people that have tried this idea, not, not podcasting events, but other events, right. have failed. And then we were getting advice from people. Okay, if you're going to do Kickstarter, the big thing you've got to have, James, you've got to have an email list. Yes. Well, oops, we don't have an email list. Right. We don't have a history of successful events on Kickstarter. We don't have an email list. We don't have experience doing events. That right there seems like a recipe for failure. Oh, for three. It does seem like that. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be a clear indication, clear wisdom for most people to yeah. say, walk away. Yes. But we weren't those guys. That's good. That's good. I'm <laughs> so glad you weren't. So we knew that we could validate the idea. So we didn't have an audience. We didn't have an email list. But we had a network of podcasters. So we reached out to our podcast friends and we said, hey, would you speak at this event? Would you come to it? Would you share it? Would you help us? Would you support us? Most of them said yes. Yep. And then we knew, okay, let's go for it. We had a little video made, uh, I believe it was through 99designs, one of those sites. Had a little cartoon video made that's about a minute and a half talking about the idea. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. Here's some of the rewards if you participate and support us financially. And then we launched. <laughs> and we weren't sure. We needed $11,000, James. We were being as conservative as possible. Yeah. $11,000 would get us a small conference center in Addison, which is a suburb of Dallas. Yes. We knew, $11,000. If we can't get $11,000, we have no business trying to do this. We launch, and within nine hours, James, nine hours of being on Kickstarter, we hit $11,000. Amazing. And no email list. Yeah. So, I mean, we were really encouraged by that. You fast forward 30 days, and we had over $30,000 from our Kickstarter campaign. Wow. And we had already outgrown that small conference center in Addison, so we had to upgrade to a new hotel. So there was a whole series of events that happened after that. We had great speakers that came online, people like uh, John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneur on Fire and, and Cliff Ravenscraft from Podcast Answer Man, Jamie Tardy from The Eventual Millionaire, uh, Serena Rao from Unmistakable Creative. Yep. We had uh, Chris Brogan. I don't think yeah. you know, most people <laughs> probably going to know who Chris Brogan is. Right. Uh, it was just such an exciting wave to see all these people want to support this thing. And we had the event this past August, August in Dallas, Texas, and James, you were, you were a speaker. I was. At this event that had never happened. It wasn't even thought of just several months before. Yeah. But we went through the process. We got good advice from PT. We validated the idea through Kickstarter, and then we did just lots of homework and worked really hard, and we were able to put on Podcast Movement in Dallas. Yeah, that, you know, that, that is awesome. I'm, and I appreciate you guys doing it, and I think the name was appropriate because I think there is a movement behind podcasting. And, you know, when I look at the new and noteworthy in, in iTunes and I see all these new podcasts week in and week out, I am just amazed. And yet there's still only about 50 or 60,000 uh, podcasts out there right now, or excuse me, about 200,000. Right? Well, there's so, not many. And, and about 90% of the total podcasts that are in iTunes are abandoned or yes. they're terrible. Yeah. Meaning the quality is not any good. So, right. One of the messages that you and I get to share at FinCon in our session is encouraging bloggers, hey, whether you're repurposing your blog and just having an audio version of your blog or you're doing straight up a podcast, you should consider having a podcast in iTunes because there's yes. more and more people who are reclaiming that downtime, who are listening to podcasts. We have the iOS 8 update yes. that just went out yesterday where the podcast app is on every Apple device now. Right. People are going to be in there. They're going to be looking. They're going to be looking for those categories, those finance categories. They're going to find your podcast, start listening to that. Absolutely. It's just a whole new opportunity to connect with a different group of people. Yeah, our economy's not getting that much better. Financial podcasts <laughs> yeah, will well thrive. Said. Will thrive. Good points. 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> You're a good host, James. Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, you know, I, I ask good questions. That's <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'll tell you what, if I didn't know any better, I'd think you, uh, you represented Country Financial because yeah. you're so good. I am. I am. <laughs> so besides the, the podcast movement, now you've also written a book, Podcasting Good to Great. What made you decide to do that? And, uh, and, and you know, how has that gone for you since, since it's launched? I know you launched it at Podcast Movement. Tell me about that. As you know, Kindle, now with self-publishing, it's the democratization of publishing. Absolutely. So anybody can go and write a book, yep. and that's good and bad. <laughs> so maybe some people probably shouldn't do that. It is nice to know that anybody who's willing, who's determined, who's driven can do that. And I knew it's possible to write a book, but I'm not a writer. We talked about that earlier in the interview. I wanted a podcast because I'm not a writer. However, that said, I was fortunate in the preparation for a podcast movement, the promotion, the marketing. We reached out to John Dumas. He has a big podcasting community called Podcasters Paradise. And we wanted to uh, connect with that group through John Dumas and, yeah. and see if we could get some of those people on board with podcast movement. We went to John and said, hey, can we deliver a content piece, a webinar where we share some information, and then at the end we tell them about podcast movement, and then we conveniently send them to John Lee Dumas's affiliate link. There you go. <laughs> right? Makes yeah. sense. And he was all for it. He Absolutely. loved the idea. Yeah. And so Dan Franks, my business partner, and I, we, we, got our, we got together and said, hey, one of the things that's worked really well with podcast movement up to that point, we had not done the event yet, but we had worked together. We yeah. had had collaboration. And we thought, you know, that's a message that not a lot of podcasters are hearing is, hey, you can grow your audience, you can grow your visibility if you collaborate with other people. Right. Let's talk about that. So we came up with a top 10 list because at the time, David Letterman had recently announced he was retiring. And we thought, hey, yep. let's pay tribute to someone who's interviewed so many people we can't even count. Right. So we paid tribute to David Letterman by doing a top 10 list of how to grow your audience through collaboration. And did that webinar at the end. We talked about podcast movement, and we conveniently pointed them to John, John Lee Dumas' affiliate link, and we sold a lot of tickets that way. And then not only that, I got a lot of messages from people I knew, people I didn't know, that they were excited about the idea of collaboration. Yeah. They were thinking, hey, this is a, a cool way that, that doesn't feel weird. You know, right. it's, a, it's just a genuine way, authentic. authentic way to grow, yeah. grow your network, grow your audience. And hearing that made me realize, okay, that message resonated, and that would be a good thing to repurpose later on. Right. So let's fast forward. You and I have a mutual friend. His name's Ellery Wells. Yes. And Ellery did something I thought was really brave. He wrote a book, and it was actually a podcasting book. It was, it was. about starting, and you could start within a budget of under $200, and he paints out everything you need to do and you need to know in order to do that. Yes. Accomplish that goal. It's and the book, book launched, and as you said, it's a great book, but it didn't get the results it probably should have. And lesson learned, you know, there, there's strategies for everything. Right? Some marketing strategies don't work. Some are really amazing. So the good news is it, the story doesn't end there. Right. Ellery met Jimmy Burgess, Burgess, which is a friend of yours as well. Yes. And Jimmy's strength is helping new authors create the best launch possible on Amazon. Yeah. So Jimmy worked with Ellery. They teamed up. They did a relaunch of the book. And sure enough, the book was extremely successful. It was number one in multiple categories. There was pictures taken and posted on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> and I remember just feeling so excited for Ellery. And Absolutely. I was thinking, well-deserved Ellery. And then it triggered. It was like, Ellery did this. This can be done. Most people just don't know how to do it. Right. But they could do it. I could write a book. But what would I write a book about? Ah, oh, that presentation. Ha ha. I could take that presentation for Podcasters Paradise, repurpose that into a book, expand on it. I could probably knock it out in a few weeks and then launch it in Amazon. And then maybe if I can get enough people to buy the book on a single day, like spike the sales, have a yep. lower price point, I might be able to have a best-selling book in Amazon. Wouldn't that be something? It would be. So we thought, let's go for it. I, I connected with Jimmy. Jimmy walked me through the steps. And uh, Steve Stewart's walking out real, real quick. We just want to acknowledge <laughs> Steve Stewart. Steve's a good Bye, man. Hi, Steve. Yeah, we love Steve. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. You know, you get, sometimes you got to take a break and say hi to Steve. So, <laughs> that's the right thing to do in a podcast. He's laughing. All right. <laughs> so yeah, we follow the, the steps, and you know, James, timing can be everything. You know this. Absolutely. Podcast movement was coming up, but it wasn't the only event. There was also a smaller podcasting event in the UK on that same Saturday. That's right. So there was two events going on for podcasters on the same day. One was huge, and one was uh, just on another country. I thought, let's launch on the Friday of podcast movement. Let's get the word out. Let's leverage the two hashtags for both events. Yeah. 
and let's just see what happens. Let's lower the price point. Let's just push it out there. Let me and, you know, tell all my friends and family. So we followed that, and the book started selling really quickly. We got it out there. And I was a little nervous because I'd never written a book before, yeah. but I did my absolute best. I had an editor to help me clean it up, polish it, make it good enough right. to ship. Put the book out there, and it hit number one in three categories like that. Congratulations. And it was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's something I never thought I would do. That's amazing. And now let's not kid ourselves. It was an inexpensive book for that weekend. The price sure. was gone up. <laughs> yeah. uh, but at that weekend, it was a low price point. Sure. And there was a lot of people that are real focused on podcasting that particular day. So I'm sure that played a role. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. But it worked. Absolutely. It worked. And now I'm still getting people who message me that don't listen to my podcast, that didn't attend Podcast Movement or FinCon, but they found the book. Yeah. They found the book on Amazon. They're interested in the topic. And now they're reaching out to me. And I'm having a conversation with a whole new audience. It's an amazing thing. It's funny. Um, I, I, was, uh, I, I go to Toastmasters, as you know. And uh, a lady came up to me afterwards and she said, how, do you, how did you get into this thing that you're doing? And I said, well, what exactly do you mean? How did I come up with the idea or how did I technically do it? And she said, well, kind of both. And, I, and so I took her through it. But she was asking, like, well, once you write stuff on your blog, how do you get people to look at it? How do you do that? Mm-hmm. And I said, well, you know, it just so happens a friend of mine wrote a book. And I said, <laughs> it's about podcasting, but it's going gonna, it's gonna, to – you can use those same techniques in blogging. So I think I, I was at least responsible for one sale. <laughs> uh, I hope you used your affiliate link for that yeah, sale. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I did. I did. Yeah, Good my man. Amazon Good affiliate. Man. Yeah, yeah. Good man. You know, the other <laughs> thing you. i got to say is, is that uh, – you know, I was out of town that weekend, and so I couldn't participate in the in the buy at the right time. So uh, uh, one of the gentlemen that was helping you with that even chided me for buying at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, the goal was to have was everybody like, buy on a certain day, I, I so understand. people were purchasing yeah, yeah. it before that day. It was yeah. like, oh, you're going to mess yeah. up the chances of exactly. it hitting number one. Exactly. But thankfully, you're, you know, yeah, you didn't have an it, impact no, on it. It no, still, no, no still did really impact. well. Yeah. So. yeah. So podcast movement, let's go back to that for a minute. So it was very successful. I've heard really good things about it. Um, as you said, you had great attendance. And the thing that really struck me about it is how much energy there was around it, right? And I don't think you guys really realized that. I mean, obviously, when you did the Kickstarter and it, it funded so quickly, you probably had an inkling. But it, it was like there was this pent-up demand for something like this that just wasn't really being addressed. And people... I mean, I remember the buzz on social media when, when you guys started your Kickstarter campaign and how much, uh, how, how much people were talking about it, and looking forward to it, and doing all those kinds of things. So, so now this event has been held. Uh, there's still buzz about it. I still see people talking about it, posting about it, and so forth. So what's next for Podcast Movement? Where are you guys going next? Well, Podcast Movement, we announced we're going to do it again. So year one was successful. We're gonna uh, we're, we're gluttons for punishment, right? We're gonna, I love it. We're yeah. gonna have it again. So it's gonna be the first weekend of August in Fort Worth, Texas, at the Omni it. Hotel. And we announced our opening keynote speaker is Pat Flynn from SmartPassiveIncome.com. So we're excited right. about that. Pat's no stranger to FinCon, of course. Yes, and just an awesome guy. So and uh, you know sometimes you got to stop what you're doing and just recognize Steve Stewart. Steve Stewart, Steve ladies Stewart. and gentlemen, <laughs> Money Plan <laughs> SOS. Steve Stewart. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's like the energy. No, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Maybe, maybe that wasn't the same no, energy. No. But <laughs> well, I, I personally have to say I like it being in Fort Worth. Uh, I mean, Dallas was great. That's only about thirty miles from my house, but you know, I actually live in Fort Worth, so I'm a little biased. <laughs> and the downtown is a really great area, so I think you guys did a good job there, and, and people will really enjoy that uh, for any of the outings and plenty of uh, places to have uh, some interesting hangouts. One, one of the big questions in determining, you know, to do year two was. Uh, how far is it from James' house? <laughs> can we can we persuade James to, James to come again? You can, so, you can, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah. I think I think my, the price of my ticket just went up because well, now I'm committed. But <laughs> uh, you you asked what else is going on. Now, so this isn't actually the podcast movement, but Dan and I got together and said, hey, clearly there's uh, people that are, are hungry for this information, and not everybody has the budget right to fly to Dallas. That's right and attend an event, or maybe the one event they're going to attend is FinCon, and they can't afford to attend a podcasting event. Right. That makes sense, right? So we're doing an online conference in January. It's going to be the Business Podcaster Summit. We're going to be announcing that soon. I believe it's businesspodcastersummit.com. I may not be right on that. I'll send you the link so you can put it in the show notes. But that's going to be an online conference for business-focused podcasters. Okay. Fantastic. Yep. And, uh, and you also have uh, Podmove University, right? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Okay, so, so Podmove is interesting because we found a niche 
uh, and not even really trying to find it. And, and that may be true for, for any of your listeners who are business focused. You know, you, you're talking to your audience or you're talking to people and you hear what kind of pain is, is coming up, what kind of struggles they're dealing with, and you can figure out a solution to that. So when we first opened up the speaker submissions for podcast movement, we had over 150 people submit to speak. Wow. And there was nowhere near the opportunities, you know, to cover, you know, even a, a third of that. Right. So that was a discouraging thing for us because we're podcasters. We know what it's like to have a, a message that you want to share and not have an event to go share it at. Right. And so we sympathize with those guys, and we looked through – and we only had a few spots to select because when we first started Kickstarter, we felt like we had to announce a lot of the speakers up front. Right. And so we only had a few spots left. And so when we were choosing, we had to be really judicious about who we were picking. And there was just so many good sessions that didn't get picked. Right. And we, we felt awful about that. So, but that was the aha moment, James. We realized, hey, there's a lot of podcasters that want to share their expertise. There's just not a central place for them to do it. Right. And so we went back to some of those people and said, hey, instead of you speaking at the event, which we, we wish we had the room for, would you be willing to consider doing a tutorial of, you know, the message that you submitted to speak at Podcast Movement? Just make that a tutorial that we can create an online university for podcasters. Okay. And almost everybody that we, we said that to was like, yeah, let's do it. And so <laughs> what's funny is now all of a sudden we have multiple podcasters who are creating really good tutorials for people who are in podcasting. And now we got a big library of this wow. video content. Hey, that makes sense. Let's create an online university that's reasonably priced so that a new podcaster or someone who's been doing it a while that, that wants to learn but, but doesn't want to uh, spend, uh, maybe they don't have a big budget to go spend thousands of dollars, but they can you know find a little bit of money each month to, to educate themselves and we we subscribe to the idea james that the community is smarter than the individual right we like that so this is a community thing this is a collaboration thing right and it's the community sharing their expertise and so they've got so much good content and it's coming out each month we do office hour sessions where we get together and we actually put one of the people in the um, university in the hot seat and we do a review of their podcast oh okay. so everybody gets to give their feedback to that person that's incredibly valuable to Absolutely. the person who's on the hot seat. They get all this good information. It's all constructive. So, so you mentioned you're in Toastmasters. So you go to Toastmasters, you do a speech, and then people give you an evaluation on the speech. Right. It's a similar thing, but you got the whole group doing it. Wow. <laughs> so it, it can be intimidating, but it's in a positive way. And, yeah, so we, we've got the tutorials. We've got the office hours. We've got a, a student union, which is a, a private Facebook group where people are in there every day, and we're talking about different things that are going on with their shows, if they're having challenges. If they had a win, they get to share that. There's all kinds of cool things that are happening, a lot of synergy, and it's just a positive group. It's a small group right now, um, and we're okay with that. It's kind of like our beta group, and we're growing yeah. it little bit by little bit. But, yeah, the Pod Move University basically came from people wanting to share their expertise and not having a central place to do it, and then creating a library of that and then realizing, hey, there's a whole group that's going to come into podcasting that's not going to have the budget to spend on these other opportunities, but they might want to learn from the group. So, so is that podmove.com? That's right, P-O-D-M-O-V.com. Okay. And uh, for anybody who might be interested in that and they're looking to start a podcast, uh, uh, how, how much is that? Um, it's, it's, I believe, $30 a month, but we have actually a free tutorial that's going up here in the next week or so, James, okay. that'll walk someone through exactly how to start a podcast. Oh, so fantastic. that's free. You wow. know, we're not, we're not, we want you to start a podcast. If you start a podcast, you're going to want to learn more, and we've got a really good group that you can learn from. There's lots of good groups, but we have a, a good one, too. So if somebody so. was a financial blogger and they had a lot of content and they wanted to repurpose that content uh, and, and allow people to hear them, talk about it rather than uh, be in front of a computer screen so people could listen to them when they're uh, out jogging or driving somewhere. Uh, it seems like that might be something they would want to do is to come to Podmove. They, well, whether or not they come to Podmove, they should definitely do that. <laughs> and there's ways to do that that won't cost you a single dime. And you could uh, set up an account uh, with certain, um, you know, certain sites out there. I could name several, but there's different sites out there that allow you to upload audio and you can then create an RSS feed. I don't want to get complicated, but <laughs> that's, that's as simple as it. it could, some people uh, could just repurpose their blog by talking into an app on their phone. Yes. A free app on their phone, yes. having that go out to their RSS feed, and then going out to iTunes and Stitcher, and then having a presence 
in a whole new market, a whole new, or a whole new, not new market, but a whole new place where people can find them that aren't going to read the blog. So, right. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's a powerful opportunity for sure, especially with the update we just talked about with iOS 8. And, and, and really, that's the reason I started a podcast. I, I, I started a blog, and I started thinking, you know, I don't have time to read blogs anymore. And so I listened to podcasts, and so I said, I've got to start a podcast to get my message out. And, uh, and so, I, I'm, yeah, I'm with you. I really encourage people to go out and do that, exactly that. My friend Mark Sievercrop, he has a blog, and he, he's basically sharing networking tips. And he had a reasonable readership. It's not a huge blog. But I persuaded him finally after trying for a long time, hey, create an audio version of your blog because I'll listen to it. I'm not yeah. going to read all your posts, but I'll listen to your audio blog. Yeah. So I helped him go through the steps. He creates the audio blog. So now after he writes his blog post, just takes a few minutes, records it onto his iPhone or in a, in a microphone. He uploads it. And now, so three months later, he's got twice the traffic to yes. his blog. And uh, compared to the subscribed uh, readers to his blog, he has seven times that who listen to his actual there you go. audio version of his blog. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer. It's a powerful and it, tool. And it doesn't cost him any money. Yeah. Absolutely right. Well, Jared, we covered a lot of things that you've got going on. Is there anything... Uh, else on the horizon that we need to cover? On the horizon, well, what we just talked about, the audio blog. I, I'm actually going to write a book about that because I think it's so important. I think, you know, if you can do this for free, it doesn't cost you any money. There's really no barrier of entry. Why wouldn't you do this? You don't have to add to your workflow other than just recording, reading your blog. Yes. So I'm going to write a book called the audio blog. I'm in the process of writing a book, the audio blog strategy. And <laughs> I got a little sidetracked in writing that book because another friend of mine said, hey, co-write this book with me. And I couldn't <laughs> say no. It's a friend named Kamanzi. Yes. And so we're writing a book called, <laughs> it's just a great title, Stop Chasing Influencers and Become One Yourself. Oh, I love it. I <laughs> so love the it. idea is, is, is how does someone become an influencer? And sometimes it's not necessarily chasing people who are influential. So, no, yeah. right. That, that reminds me of, uh, of, of the, uh, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts as we talked about earlier. I, I can't remember who it was. I think it was uh, the guys at Internet Business Mastery. But they said, uh, at, at some point, you've got to stop consuming content and start creating content. Yep. And, that was, and that was a real eye-opener for me and made me really rethink what I was doing. Because I was reading a lot of books. I was consuming a lot of podcasts. But I wasn't creating anything. I was dreaming about it. Yep. And eventually, I had to you know, get the computer out, dust it off, and uh, start creating some content. I knew you during that time. <laughs> you and I first started talking when you were in that season. That's and right. To see where you are now versus then, it's a, it's a massive difference, but it was because you took action. I did. I did. And that is the key. That is the key. I, I can't remember uh, who it was, but there was a gentleman who was talking, and uh, uh, they, they challenged some people, and they said, it was a conference of like 100 people, in, and they said, okay, uh, who is going to you know, do this thing. And I can't remember what it was, but the, everybody in the room raised their hand and said, okay, we are going to commit to do this, this thing. And, and two days later, uh, when the conference was, was ending, they found out that only three people had actually completed that. And that's what this guy said. He said, of all the people who commit to do something, only about 3% ever really take action. So that's right. if you're out there listening and you have an idea or, or you have a dream that you want to pursue, uh, starting a blog, starting a podcast, starting a business, you know, do owning what, a cash car, owning a cash car, right? Do do what Dan and Jared did uh, related to the podcast movement and take action, and and otherwise we wouldn't have had that great conference, and uh, and or your podcast or my podcast or Steve Stewart's podcast. I mean, we all had to take action. So so get out there and do it. Okay, can I ask you a couple questions? All right, let's let's talk cars for a few minutes because it is all the right. cash car convert. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. For uh, for a friend, yes, right? yes. <laughs> this segment's called for a friend. Got it. <laughs> All right. So for a friend, uh, this question is from Steve S from Missouri. <laughs> Steve S from Missouri. That sounds familiar. <laughs> so Steve S from Missouri is written into the mailbag, and he says, "James, how do I purchase a cash car if I don't have any cash?" Yeah. What yeah. advice do you give to Steve S from Missouri? <laughs> well. What I recommend is for people to uh, do what they have to do to, to raise cash in any way. They can uh, take an extra job. They can sell some things. And when I talk about people buying a cash car, I'm really only talking like three to five thousand dollars. And and I think you can find good quality cars in that in that space. Uh, if you've had a car with payments long enough, then maybe you've got enough equity built up to do that. Although uh, most people these days tend to be a little more upside down in their cars, so that's not really going to help them. 
Uh, but really, that's that's the basic answer: is you have to uh, you have to want it bad enough to do the extra things, sell what you have to sell, or or work some additional hours to raise that cash. Okay, I can see Steve is is probably shaking his head as he listens to this podcast and thinking. Can I really get a good car for three to five thousand dollars, James? You can, you can. As I like to say, it's not sexy, but it'll get you <laughs> from point A to point B reliably and consistently. And if you maintain it, then it'll work for you. Most cars these days go, uh, you know, about two hundred fifty thousand miles. So you find a good used car with, you know, somewhere about a hundred, one hundred twenty thousand miles, maybe one hundred fifty thousand miles. You maintain it into the future, and it's gonna, it's gonna do a good job for you. So what do you recommend to the person who's saying, okay, I'm going to raise $3,000 cash, I'm going to sell stuff, I'm going to get that little side job or cut grass or whatever it is. Right. They've, they've got that three, three grand, three to five grand. Where do, where do they go? What do they do? Yeah. So it's, it, it, my favorite two places to go really are Auto Trader or uh, Craigslist. And there's frustrations with, with both of those, but, but that's where I like to go. Uh, but before that, really, I, what I would do is I would go out to Consumer Reports and I would decide what kind of car I'm interested in. And then I would do some research on the quality of the cars and find out, you know, what are their weaknesses, what are their strengths. And look for some that are really going to have good reliability uh, and have a good history of that. I mean, it's kind of easy to say Toyota and Honda do, but even some of their models don't have good uh, long-term reliability. So, yeah, so having some place like Consumer Reports or going to Edmunds.com or KBB, they all have places that allow you to do research on your car. The other thing that most people don't think about is the total cost of ownership. Most people just think about the acquisition cost. So maybe you could find, I mean, you're, you're out there and you're looking on Craigslist and you find uh, sort of an older Mercedes, but it's in great shape and you're thinking, hey, wow, I could look good doing that. I could drive a cheap car and really look good doing it. Well, the problem with that is that uh, the maintenance costs, right? You go to do a repair and, uh, and you find out that a shock is $1,000 or something, right? So, so you want to be, uh, you want to look at your lifestyle, what's really going to work for you. Do you have a big family? Do you need an SUV or a minivan? Um, are you a single uh, person going to college? Maybe you just need a, a small, uh, you know, a two, two-door coupe of some sort. Uh, you know, so look at what your lifestyle is. Look at the total cost of ownership. Look at the reliability. And then once you've done some of those things and you've got an idea of what you want to look for, go out to Craigslist or, or uh, autotrader.com and do some searches uh, in your price range. And, and some of the things I like to do to try to get good cars is I, I think one-owner cars, two-owner cars, they're better uh, than, than getting a car that, that's been passed down a lot. Um, I also recommend only buying from a private seller if you're under $5,000 because if you have uh, uh, if you're buying from a dealer at that level, you're really working at the lower end of the dealer lots, and uh, and, and there's going to be no history. You're not going to know anything about the car. Um, if you can buy a one-owner car where the person's got a lot of documentation, then you're really, uh, you know, tilting the scales in your favor about as much as you can. And uh, and so again, not going to be sexy, but you're looking for reliable, and uh, and I think you can definitely find that, and, and, and that's that's kind of the way I would go about that. All right, all right, Steve, so for the person that says to you, hey, I, I really want this particular type of car, and they got this great deal on, on a lease. It's a great deal. It's a lease. It, it's my favorite car. James, what do I do? Yeah, run. Run. run, run why why run, would you run. run from a great deal on a lease, James? <laughs> well, there's been some research done, and, and what they've found is that a, a, if you buy a, a new car and you lease it, and they did a, this study was over six years, so you had to lease a car twice over uh, two, three year leases versus buying a car on a five year note versus buying a used car on a four year note. And what they found is that buying the two year old car was about $8,000 cheaper than buying the new car and about $12,000 cheaper than buying the leased car. Wow. The other thing I would add is that. Uh, even though people are kind of sucked in by leasing because they're, they're a lower monthly cost, and, and that's kind of a sad thing to me, that people really focus on monthly payments. They don't really focus on the cost. But uh, so, yeah, you're making uh, – so the average car payment today for a new car is $474 a month. The average uh, lease right now is $419. So, so there's a nice little delta there so people can, can – they can buy their cars or they can lease them. But at the end of three years in a lease – you've got nothing to show for it. At least if you buy a car and you pay that you know, average 66 months of payments, at least at the end of it, you've got a car that's probably worth $14,000. 
at the end of that lease, you got nada. You're starting over from scratch. Man. Well, James, I, I really appreciate that. I'm sure there's other questions we could get to in the mailbag, but I know we're probably running a little bit short of time here. So what, what are your final thoughts for the good people here at FinCon? Well, it's my first FinCon. I'm really excited to be here. It was a pleasure to be up here with my good friend, Jared Easley. Thank you, Jared, for joining me tonight. <laughs> my pleasure. And uh, we're, I hope you'll all come out and listen to our uh, panel tomorrow on podcasting. We're going to give you a lot of good reasons to start a podcast. It's going to be amazing. Amazing. And we're going to give away a couple of uh, ATR2100 microphones to uh, help somebody get started with a podcast. And, and, I, and I just want to let the record show that we appreciate Country Financial. Absolutely. Country Financial is appreciated. They rock this place. <laughs> All right, James. Thanks, So this man. is James Kenson, the Cash Car Convert, signing off. Thank you.